Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth. <sighs> what a game. If I had to describe it in one word, I couldn't. I'd be too busy going before I could even say anything. There are so many things that make this game incredible, from the gameplay to the story to the music, and I'm here to tell you about as much of it as I can before I get too impatient and just go back to playing the game. Starting right... Now, this game is a direct sequel to 2020's Yakuza Like a Dragon, and this one makes that one look like it was made by a bunch of uni students who failed their degree in their first year. To say that Infinite Wealth is an improvement to that game would honestly be an insult because this game's just a bloody revolution. If you'd like a super in-depth analysis and all the changes and new stuff with this game, you can go ahead and watch this incredible video made by a super sexy man after you watch this one. But to summarize some of the biggest improvements, I'll start with the most important one. Infinite Wealth added the ability to move in combat, which for any turn-based RPG you'd probably think, so? But for this game, it adds such a massive layer to the gameplay. There's also features that were exclusive to certain characters or jobs, which have been given to everyone, like being able to pick up environmental objects to use as weapons like bikes or bins, and generating your MP from normal attacks. In fact, there's a ton of new or improved features relating to your position in battle, and how you use your basic attacks, which in the previous game, your position was just down to how much the game wanted to troll you, and your basic attacks were just tickle devices you'd use for a laugh. I could go on for minutes about all of the changes and improvements made to this, 37 to be precise, but a lot of the biggest stuff was observable in this game's demo, which has been playable since early November, so rather than just repeating myself for another 37 minutes, I'm going to talk about the improvements made in the full game. To start, here's a feature that I was shocked by the announcement of in social media, which is that you can just insta-kill weak enemies that you don't want to waste your time with. The trade-off for an instant victory is that the rewards you receive are lessened, but that's one of the many quality of life features made in this game that give you the chance to just focus more on having fun. There's also this special dungeon area you can go to, which is quite literally just Mystery Dungeon, and somehow Sega managed to make a freaking Mystery Dungeon game before Pokemon made another one, because, I mean, not like anyone's asking for another Pokemon Mystery Dungeon game or anything. But fun fact, this game also has Fog of War covering the map in Hawaii, which Yokohama had in Yakuza Like a Dragon, and I'm really happy to see this feature return. It's what I would say if it weren't for the fact that this feature sucks, just use Google Maps Ichiban, you dickhead. You can also learn new auto battle tactics like Protect the Leader, which that one specifically can be unlocked from playing Shogi. I will never use it though, lol. And after like 50 hours, I never saw another auto battle tactic you could unlock, so I don't know what else there is. And then this isn't exactly gameplay related, but I also just wanted to point out that just like with Gaiden, this game has done a fantastic job at looking bloody gorgeous. It was mostly down to the lighting, as well as implementation of some technology like DLSS, despite that thing's problems it can have, that has allowed Gaiden and Infinite Wealth to both look so much better than previous games. The cutscenes that are just the hit X to skip ones look way better. The color choices are so much better. Even the freaking map screen looks better. If you have a display that supports HDR as well, please for the love of Go! Turn that shit on. You will not at all regret it. But anyway, there's a super fat chunk of brand new content to enjoy in this game, almost to the point of it being excessive. Obviously, there's tons of new fights to experience doing the main story or out in the open world, but there's also plenty of new jobs, skills, and weapons you can use to smack the shit out of those enemies in various ways. In saying that though, as I'm recording this, I don't believe that there are any skills in the game that consume HP rather than MP, similar to what you see in Persona. Not that that's essential, but I sort of thought it would be interesting to see skills that do that. And I was also kind of hoping for passive skills that are unique to the jobs, as well as maybe a job or multiple jobs that focus more on supporting party members with buffs or debuffing enemies, rather than how it was in Like a Dragon where a support job just heals and can very much still dish out damage. Realistically though, those are very much non-issues, especially given how much this game did add and improve from the last one, but I feel that they're gonna need more stuff like that before the core combat of the game can actually rival a proper turn-based RPG. Although in saying that, from what I've played so far, I cannot stress to you enough just how much more thought I've put into every single turn, and with stuff like the rework skill inheritance, where you now have up to six slots to slot in skills from other jobs, it's made it so that I have to carefully consider what build to go with with my party members so that I'm not just wasting slots. Maybe a character needs a grapple skill, or perhaps they're lacking in magic or certain buffs or healing skills. You kind of need to optimize your loadout to do some of the fights in this game, because it is also significantly more challenging than the last one, which I'm so happy to see. Furthermore, all skills that deal medium damage, for example, all feel like they deal roughly the same amount of damage, meaning that where your choices come in are in the form of what attack type it is, or what extra benefits it might have, or the MP cost. There's actual consideration to consider. There's some exceptions to this, like some skills that are way better than other similar ones, such as the Samurai's Fire Arrow skill, which for some reason just 
obliterates everything that doesn't resist fire or gun. But regardless, it is nowhere near the level of absurdly poor balancing that Yakuza Like a Dragon was like. Character levels are also significantly more important than job levels, and so it means you're free to experiment more and learn what you like or what you need to be as efficient in combat as possible. Although, you can kinda still mash whatever skills and heal when need be, because there's still seemingly no enemies that might be immune to a certain damage type or something. And even though it's done much better, you can sort of attack enemies with types they resist, with the only downside being that your fight is going to go a little bit longer. But where a series like Persona, like I mentioned before, has better thought out combat, Yakuza Like a Dragon, as well as Infinite Wealth, have the benefit of being Yakuza games, which means a gargantuan amount of ridiculously fun side content. I mean, even one of the mini games is literally Pokemon. Of course, that's not as in-depth as actual Pokemon, nor is the Animal Crossing style mini game not as in-depth as actual Animal Crossing. But side activities like that just give so much incentive to completely forget the main game and just play them for hours. They've also got a crazy taxi homage, Uber Eats minigame, whatever you'd call it. Pokemon Snap, but I swear to God, like everyone who said positive things about this minigame was paid to do it because it, it's boring as shit. But you know what's not boring? Having Spike Out as an arcade game, which fun fact was made by RGG Studio long before they were called that and long before the Yakuza series was even a thing, which when you look at it, you can see there are a lot of things that eventually worked their way into Yakuza, like how long battles are basically structured, or stuff like Mine from Yakuza 3's fighting style. You can also go ahead and catch some... A lot of mini games from the first game are also still here, like Can Quest, where you ride around and pick up cans, which sounds boring, but I promise it isn't, as well as the little quiz mini game, which not only is a way to quiz yourself, but also level up Ichiban's personality stats, so it's both fun and rewarding. Except when you're like, oh yeah, music theory quiz, let's go, I'm gonna ace this, and then it, it just asks you questions like, what was the name of Beethoven's dog? And I'm like, I don't know, Beethoven? How am I supposed to know that, Sega? Why don't you ask questions that actually make sense, like who is Mr. Worldwide? But man, some of the stuff you can do in this game is crazy, but nothing beats the sheer insanity from some of the encounters you can have in the open world. Something I've actually noticed with this game is um, when you go to target an enemy, and this is like compared to the original game, wait, oh, I have no idea what is happening. Um, HOLY SHIT! But speaking of the open world, in the full game we get to explore the entirety of Hawaii, well, the Hawaii map, not the actual place, which in the demo was locked to a rather small section of it. And man, is it fun to explore. Not only is Hawaii a new map in the game for the first time since, coincidentally, Yakuza Like a Dragon in 2020, but it is also the very first time that one of these games lets you run around outside of Japan. All the new sights and sounds are so refreshing and exciting, and honestly, although I've never been to Hawaii, running around the map makes me feel like I'm going on a tour around the place or something. It's also super interesting playing these games and seeing US dollars, hearing people speak English on the streets, looking at posters, signs, shops, products that are all completely different to what I've gotten used to seeing in the game. And I'm sure there are a myriad of games set in Hawaii, but the only games I've ever played that have this place as an explorable area are the Sun and Moon Pokemon games and uh, Modern Combat 4. I don't know if anyone ever played those old like game block first person shooters on iPhone and iPad and stuff. But anyway, Sun and Moon depict a much more natural Hawaii, and it's also, you know, Pokemon, so it's not real. So this is a very unique experience for me. And because Hawaii is part of the United States, it means we don't have the tiny little Japanese cars driven by people that look like PS1, like you do in Japan. But instead, we have these big fat American piles of shit that are excessively big and are obviously used to compensate for something, and that are too big to fit in any of our driveways or car parks. STOP IMPORTING THEM FOR GOD'S SAKE! But also, part of the appeal of the previous cities, in particular Kamurocho, is that beautifully depicted nightlife with all of the neon signs shining on the streets, which Hawaii doesn't have. Well, it still does look very lovely at night, but it's just not the same as Kamurocho. Instead, you get a beautiful view of a tropical environment with the sand, the water, the trees. It's not just how it's depicted in game, but Japan has like no nature anyway, unless you go somewhere into the mountains or something like that. And although this place is rather urbanized and filled with a shitload of people clogging every turn, it's nice to see that blend of nature with the city and not have it be locked to some sort of side thing like the hunting in Yakuza 5. Again, it's all very refreshing to see in this series, and it makes me very hopeful that one day more of the games go into more countries around the world, mostly because it'll provide a unique experience, but also because I would absolutely love to see how these developers represent cities from around the world. In particular, I think that a Yakuza game set in Italy would look absolutely astounding, especially with the now properly implemented HDR settings in the games, and also because the devs are just getting better and better at creatively lighting up their environments. I also reckon you could set a game in Australia because then strange people that look like they're on drugs trying to stab you for no reason would 100% fit thematically. If they do explore new countries, it'll 
likely be a long time from now, but I am so looking forward to what they do next. Now I'm going to talk about story related stuff for a while, considering that I have already gone to great lengths talking about the gameplay and I don't really want to make the same video twice. I'm not going to spoil anything from Infinite Wealth because I'm mostly going to be talking about general things or things that are immediately noticeable very early on slash are observable in the trailers. However, I might spoil Yakuza Like a Dragon and Gaiden a bit, and that's because I'm about to say something that I have genuinely never said about this series before, which is that if you know what happens in those games, it will massively increase your enjoyment from this game's story. In fact, if you're a fan who's played through all of them, you're going to get so much out of this game. Now, if this game and Like a Dragon came out a handful of years ago, say for example this game was 2016 and Like a Dragon was 2012, I can guarantee you the characters would have been a lot different. Namba and Sawashiro would have been just completely cut with no reference to them at all. There may have been reference to the Arakawas, but not at all to the degree of Ichiban dedicating a shrine to them. Adachi would probably still be in the story, but wouldn't be a party member. Sayako would have probably been in a couple of cutscenes and that's it. And Zhao and Junki Han would have just been delegated to being behind the scenes guys with some sort of passing comment like, Oh, they're busy running the Ejin 3. But instead, we have all of these people realistically maintaining their place in Ichiban's world, but still with plenty of room for new characters to take the stage, like Jitose and Tomizawa. Gaiden and Infinite Wealth Story can kind of be looked at like a combined package, and so these two games are the first instances of the series finally accepting the history of the series and acknowledging it not in a super fan service way, but in a very realistic way. The fan service is left in the side content with Kiryu's bucket list, with him looking back on past events from past games. But anyway, the games have always had a huge problem of just completely cutting characters and completely ignoring story beats or character arcs for no reason at all whenever a new entry comes in. The only time that that has been completely 100% excusable was Yakuza 0 because it was a prequel or a spin-off like Ishin. A game like Lost Judgment was a lot better at still keeping in characters from previous games, even turning a side character into a main character instead of the other way around, like with what happened to Akiyama in 6. And even though he was kinda important in Judgment, but not at all important in Lost Judgment, they still made sure a character like Hattori was indeed in the game. But the biggest insult is how Yagami in real life would literally be on like Robert Kardashian levels of fame for what he did in court, cracking an enormous case that would have not just made headlines in Japan, but would have been known all around the entire world. But then Yagami is back to being a no named detective in Lost Judgment, with, with the worst part of that being that the kid he meets who is literally obsessed with detectives, both fiction and non-fiction, apparently doesn't know who the fuck Yagami is. Like, let's be real, this kid would have written a hundred essays on Japan's greatest detective Takuyuki Yagami for all of her school assignments and yet she's just like, Nah, you're some pedo or something. Another thing with the characters too is how they all seem to want to introduce like 70 characters and then instead of taking even at least like 35 of those characters and scrapping the rest, they just bring like four characters with them into the sequel. They do this by either killing them, which sometimes the deaths can add to the story, but other times you get a Yakuza 1 situation where they just kill people left and right because they thought that it would make the story more interesting. Or what they do more often than not is just chuck a character in jail or send them to America and never make reference to them ever again like Kuza and Shibasawa from Yakuza 0 and Saima from Yakuza 2. Or, and this is the worst one, literally just evaporate them from existence like Tanimura and Shinada who were both protagonists. While I can't exactly pin the blame on any specific people or reasons, I will say that coincidentally the less and less people like uh, <coughs> Nagoshi became involved with the games, the better the games were at acknowledging previous entries and maintaining a consistent cast of characters. And now since him and the other people that have left have left, coincidentally we have Gaiden being literally Yakuza 6 if it was even remotely good, and Infinite Wealth which is, in the truest sense, Yakuza Like a Dragon 2. If you don't want a consistent world, do what's in Blade does with alternate dimensions or what Final Fantasy does with each game being a different universe, but if you're going to keep the same people in the same cities in the same franchise, please for the love of Christ, keep on doing what you've done with this and Gaiden and make it so that your sequels are actual sequels. Because the thing I love about the Yakuza games is how they're able to make their characters not seem like characters in a story, but real people who are actually human. Now obviously poorly written characters can be a global experience, but something I often notice in a lot of Japanese media, whether it be games, shows or movies, is that they tend to rely on very typical anime tropes, which leads to almost every character being completely one note with one single personality trait. You'll find this is more common in the more anime stuff, but it gets 
really annoying when you get a character who doesn't think or act realistically, and while it's fine for a side character to do that, a lot of the time it'll be a main character. But then on the opposite end of the world, there's the Western character tropes used in a lot of Western media, who more often than not will also have a single character trait that's supposed to make them human, that being that they're just depressed. To top it all off, Western media tends to just have like five characters max, with all of them being miserable with tragic backstories and yada yada. Then on the Japanese side of things, they have 70 characters who you're supposed to keep track of, but maybe so that it's easier to do that, they all have a single defining trait with no real branching out to ever be seen. And so, to go back to my earlier point, that's why I love the Yakuza games. Sometimes they introduce a few too many characters, and in the case of someone like Yakuza 5 Kiryu, they can be super depressed, but they're all human. They're all real people with real lives, real thoughts, real emotions. When I think through some of my favorites, there's characters like Rikia from 3 or Makoto from 0, who you just want to keep safe at all times because it physically hurts you when something bad happens to them. Or there's a character like Majima who went from a goofy, not very important villain in the first game to becoming one of the two most iconic characters from the series who hides his emotions behind this psychotic persona which when you peek behind you can actually see there is something behind it. Hijikata and Ishin, Somaya and Yakuza 6, Sawashiro and Like a Dragon, Kuwano and Lost Judgment are all great examples of characters who you start out wanting to beat up but over time you realize there was a deep kindness in their eyes and then there's still to this day my favorite character being Shinada from Yakuza 5. He's the most average of all Joes. He's been beaten up by the world and he's been driven to a shitty hopeless existence. But you know what he does? He stays positive. He shows his strength of character by managing to be as optimistic as possible, and he cares so deeply for his friends, despite the fact that it would be perfectly reasonable if he just packed up and left forever. I mean, he's got a loan shark constantly harassing him for money, a person he's known for years who only seems to ever want to use Shinada for what little money he has, a girl from a soap land who treats him like a customer and not much else, a chef and a batting center attendant who are sick of seeing him showing up. There's a lot of people who want his money, but he is quite literally broker than broke. But despite the fact that they may say they want nothing to do with him, they all still care about him. They're deep and have their reasons for loving Shinada, much like how he still loves all of them. He brings a lot of heart to his relationships that they these people seem very grateful for. And even though in the back of his mind he feels so empty and lonely, and big important word here, depressed for everything that's happened to him, in his heart he knows he always needs to stay happy. And honestly, that's what makes that final scene with Shinada on the phone so emotional because it shows you what true friendship is. But after Shinada, we never saw that ever again. For a long time, there was no one as optimistic as he is, no story that shows real friendship. Or at least, that wasn't until Yakuza Like a Dragon where we got that exact thing once again. Ichiban as a character is so lovable, which is what makes his relationships with his friends so believable. Much like Shinada, the people he calls his friends are a homeless nurse who just kind of wants him to piss off, a who begrudgingly has to babysit him, a hitman who literally tries to shoot Ichiban in the head, the leader of a Chinese mafia whose members tortured Ichiban and his friends. There's plenty more examples, but despite all of that, you will find no greater depiction of friendship than in these people. And just like Shinada, Ichiban, when compared to a lot of other video game protagonists, is just a wave of optimism amongst a sea of miserable piece of shit human beings with nothing to care for. His strength is in his heart, and also his massive biceps, but mostly his heart. And that's why I love him. I'm so happy to see how he's been in the years between Like a Dragon and Infinite Wealth, showing how his relationships have grown in the time and what he's been up to. Most of the other games will do time skips to match the years between the games, but they just kind of make it seem like the protagonist or protagonists was doing literally nothing between the previous one and this one. Yakuza 3 and 5 are exceptions, but with something like Lost Judgment, they just kind of imply that Yagami's been sitting around doing piss jobs for piss money and that nothing has happened to him at all. But with Ichiban, he's got a new job, He's fallen in love with Sayaka, he's got his own apartment, he's still friends with his friends, even the dodgy homeless people that tried to rob him a bunch. He's so happy in the opening to the game, which I'm glad they've done openings like this and the one in Gaiden where it's like the opening to a movie. But that opening and all the stuff in the introduction, it just honestly brings me so much joy to see these characters I've fallen in love with having some sort of actual life beyond what we see when we play as them. Once again, it is so refreshing to see this massive shift in storytelling for the series, and it's gotten to the point now where I feel like 10 years from now, I can recommend people play multiple games, because as it stood, when people ask how to get into the series, everyone says to play through the stories, and for what? Nothing happens between the games, the characters never grow, they just disappear, and there's really like no bridges that connect the games, besides obviously you get to play as Kiryu again, but now you get to see that evolution, that growth, all that sort of stuff sells to you, the player, that this is in fact a real world you're looking into. But 
There should always be balance in the world, so now I'm going to criticize the game a bit. Something I wanted to touch up on in this section about the story is the English dub, specifically Kiryu. Before Kiryu though, the returning voice actors from the Japanese dub are, as always, brilliant, and same goes for the new characters. The Chinese dub actors, which this is the first game in the series to do a Chinese dub, are also pretty good, and most of them actually sound a lot like their Japanese counterparts. And then with the English dub, we of course have Keiji Tang, who grew on me more than I don't know, the hair on my head, I guess. I love him. He's great. Same with all the other boys and girls who came back for the dub. The new casts are great too, with Matt Yang King once again showing up because he's literally the goat. But there are some unfortunate recasts, like Daigo not being really good at all, and Sawashiro being nowhere near as good as Brian Bloom, who sadly was most likely working on the dog shit Modern Warfare 3 campaign, which was why he couldn't be in this game. Now fortunately the English dub is a third of the game, but considering a majority of people will most likely not pick the English dub, realistically is probably less than a third of the players that this even remotely matters to. But the original Yakuza game on PS2 had an English dub in the English version of the game, with Kiryu being voiced by a bloke named Daryl Carrillo, and no one corrected me on that pronunciation last time, so I'm still not sure. So I'm just going to call him Daryl. After the first one, the games never got any dubs until Fist of the North Star Lost Paradise and Judgment, with the first of those two games being a super duper spin-off, and the second being much less of a spin-off, but basically, Kiryu never got the chance to be voiced in English again until Yakuza Like a Dragon. Considering this was the game after Kiryu's supposed final game being Yakuza 6, Kiryu served a minor role in Like a Dragon, with that role basically being a symbolic passing of the torch to the new protagonist of Ichiban. So for the dub of that game, they brought back Daryl. Now, Daryl in Yakuza 1 was unfortunately... <sighs> not the best, but the dub of the first game had Mark Hamill as Majima, who despite being Mark freaking Hamill, sounded like an absolute amateur, so it's pretty safe to say that the reason the dub sucked was because of horrible direction. Cut to 2020's Like a Dragon, where the direction is bloody god tier, meaning that Daryl finally got a chance to shine. Now, while he did do a much better job in Like a Dragon, he's still... <sighs> not the best. His voice is good, deep and intimidating, but still kind like his Japanese counterpart, only not as sexy. But his acting just wasn't there, and I don't know why, because apparently he voiced Ash and Me in Destiny 2, who considering he was a vanilla Destiny 2 NPC, aka dog shit and I hate all of them, he did a good job voicing him, so I don't know what the hell's up with his Kiryu voice. But look, he only had a few scenes, and the dub directors full well thought the same thing we all thought, being that we'd never see Kiryu ever again, so who really cares? I mean, no insult to the guy, he tried his best, I'm sure, and I can tell you right now, if I tried to do anything like that, I'd fucking flop hard as shit. But regardless, cut to a couple of years later, and RGG Studio announced that Kiryu's immortal, and he's gonna be in at least three more games. Thankfully, the first one, being the Ishin remake, has already all been recorded for, besides like five new actors they're pulling in, so the English team aren't made to do a dub. But that still leaves two more games. They probably thought, ah oh, shit, maybe we should try and get someone that's a bit more qualified as a voice actor in Japanese media, or at least. Maybe that was their thought process. Not sure what happened, but long story short, after some auditions and whatnot, the guy they eventually hire is not really that famous YouTuber, Yong. Yeah, I, I can't be bothered looking at the pronunciation, so Yong. After some time, we get to properly hear Yong's performance as Kiryu in preview material for Infinite Wealth, and eventually in the full game of Like a Dragon Gaiden. And now we have someone who, in all honesty, was a bit. Ugh. Well, it, it was a miscast. Why? Well, it certainly isn't his acting that's the problem. I mean, Bro's pretty good in that respect, but his voice, it just doesn't fit. And the biggest reason for that is that Yong is too young to play such an old man. And really, I can't imagine why they would have picked him to play Kiryu, knowing full well what his Japanese voice sounds like. I mean, who knows, maybe all of the other auditions were dog shit, and this was their best choice, but it's still just so weird to me. And it most certainly wasn't the fact that he was a YouTuber that he was chosen, despite what people want to think. If it was, they would have recasted more characters to be YouTubers. They would have put Yong's name on more promotional material, they would have had him standing as the forefront for the game, but they didn't. I wouldn't be surprised if the people who casted him even use YouTube, but also ProZD was in the previous four dubs, and he's an even bigger YouTuber, but he's still never chucked onto the front of a poster or anything, or given the role of protagonist, despite being very good at what he does. But maybe what this decision all came down to was the notion of giving the little guy a chance. He's apparently been doing it for years, but I never heard Yong's voice in anything besides like two videos of his I may have watched years ago. So the first thing I ever heard him in was the Kaito Files of Shirakawa. And you know, I'm all for that sort of thing. And it makes me happy when other people are the same way. If we only ever allowed established voice actors to play important roles, we'd still just be having Troy Baker and Laura Bailey voicing everyone. And additionally, it would mean we never would have gotten Greg Chun as Yagami back in Judgment, who was able to massively expand his career thanks to that role. But Yagami was a brand new character with no history, no legacy. He was an even fresher face, figuratively of course, than his English voice actor. Kiryu, on the other hand, is a character so iconic that people who have no idea 
idea what the Yakuza or Like a Dragon series is would probably still know Kiryu. So they really should have put that very respectable mindset aside and just get an iconic voice to voice an iconic character. Not someone like Troy Baker, no, but someone who has a deep, powerful voice. Someone who has good range and a good history behind them as a highly regarded actor. Someone like, uh, you know, so someone like the voice of Arbiter from Halo 2. If they came to hear me beg, they will be disappointed. Someone like the voice actor for Julius in Saints Row. Every motherfucker here knows what we need to do. And those bitches be riding around here thinking they own these streets. I don't care what flags they fly. Rollers, Carnales, Vice Kings. Or maybe even the voice actor for Keith David in Saints Row 4. Oh yeah, actually, uh, just get Keith David to voice Kiryu. Stay alive long enough to give your boss... What's his name? Tony. You're gonna tell Tony to keep his goons out of these alleys. As of now, they're out of bounds. Anyway, long story short, Yong, you're fine. But Sega, you should've got Keith David, and I will not take any other answers from anyone else moving on. Back to praising the games though. The music, man! Oh. It should be out by now, but the game's soundtrack fortunately was released on streaming services like Spotify on the same day as the game, which is very awesome. But the physical release of the soundtrack is said to be released in March. Why so far away? Well, it's because the game has 130 songs. That's insane. I mean, they'll never get to the level of Masayoshi Soken who releases 100,000 songs a day. But still, that's a crazy amount. When I first started hearing music and trailers and the demo, I was already all in. Although I suppose that's to be expected from these composers. Honestly, I could keep talking about it, but what could I say about this game's soundtrack that I couldn't with any of the RGG titles, you know? Safe to say that my playlist is gonna have a really big fat chunk of Infinite Wealth songs at the bottom of it. And then, a little bit of criticism is a controversy that people are saying I should comment on, with that being that New Game Plus bizarrely is locked behind a paywall for the game. I mean, obviously the whole game is locked behind a paywall, but you have to spend an additional little bit of money to gain access to a feature that is kinda no-brainer to just include with the base game. According to some information released, there is going to be additional content beyond just what New Game Plus always is for the series, without being the exact same game with no variation whatsoever. And it's really boring, but at least you start with all your upgrades. But even still, it's an additional $23 here in Australia for the Master Vacation Bundle included with the Deluxe Edition, and I just think that's a bit strange. I mean, being made to pay money to play the same game again? And another thing that I don't get is... Whoa! Is that Yakuza 0, Yakuza Kiwami, Yakuza Kiwami 2, Bayonetta 1, Borderlands 2, the original Modern Warfare 2? <gasps> Dead Space 2, Deus Ex Human Revolution, Halo 3, and Halo 3 ODST specifically, Just Cause 2, Metal Gear Solid 5, The Phantom Pain, Persona 4, Golden, Saints Row 2, and 3, Sleeping Dogs, Infamous Second Son, God of War PS4, and a shitload of other games that frequently are on sale, all for less than $23, or at least slightly more than $23. Whoa! What? That's crazy! And a little bit of a concluding thought from me. Throughout this series, there have been a few instances of copy sequels. Now, obviously, this franchise is known for reusing almost every asset in almost every game, but when you look at things on a much deeper level, you start to realize that many of them are completely unique from each other, with the exceptions of these copy sequels. Five prime examples are on the PS2 with Yakuza 1 to 2, then Yakuza 3 to 4, Yakuza 0 to Kiwami 1, Yakuza 6 to Kiwami 2, and most recently, Judgment to Lost Judgment. All of these sequels made many improvements to previous games, but for the most part were practically the same game. There was Kiwami 1, which had probably less than half of the content that Zero did, but then there was also Lost Judgment, which made so many vast improvements to just the general gameplay, but it also massively improved things like how completing main objectives wasn't a pain in the ass, because Judgment had many things in its main story, such as all the tailing missions, which were really freaking boring. But even though the series is constantly improving, there's not really any game that if you were to play the direct sequel of would be a struggle to go back to, or at least that was the case until Lost Judgment came out, so many of the improvements the game made made it incredibly difficult to go back to Judgment. It's especially the case when you do a fresh save file. I mean, your combo speed starts so insanely slow, you feel weak as pissed, you only have two fighting styles, one of which is practically worthless. Like, it's a struggle. But I've beaten Judgment three times since playing Lost Judgment, so it really isn't that big of a deal. Anyway, this was all a lead up to say that I was kinda expecting the same thing to happen with Infinite Wealth, and now after playing the demo and the final release of Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth, it has genuinely made me never want to go back to Yakuza Like a Dragon ever again. The improvements are so extraordinary that unless I really need to, I feel like I genuinely will never launch Yakuza Like a Dragon ever again. But speaking of both the turn-based games and Lost Judgment, when Yakuza Like a Dragon first came out, there was a lot of stupidity on the internet, as there tends to be, with people saying that the series was dead, 
And now that they've turned towards this turn-based JRPG crap, the brawler combat is forever dead and all these people want is just another brawler game. I guess these people forgot about Dead Souls or something, but anyway. After all of that whinging, we then got Lost Judgment, Like a Dragon Nation, Like a Dragon Gaiden, and the Kaito Files 2 if you want to count that. So basically, after a great first attempt at working with a different genre, we got Lost Judgment and Gaiden, the two games with easily the best combat in the series. How could that have happened, you may wonder? Well, not because they heard complaints and tried to satisfy people's demands, but because Like a Dragon never spelt the end of the classic gameplay. It just signified a much deserved refresh. In any creative field, when you start to do the same thing over and over again with no real variation, you stop thinking about, all right, what's next? And you just seep into the mindset of, here we go again. And so when you start getting to the stage where you just can't really see how you're going to move forward, you need to swap to something completely different to refresh yourself so that you can come back to what you were doing better than ever before. If you ever hear someone say that they have good taste in music and you check out their playlist and it's all just one genre of music, they are a big fat liar. Good taste is a song and guidance, but it's also variation. The same can be applied to really anything, but for this video, it's applicable to taste in video games. You should, as someone who enjoys games, be able to enjoy multiple genres. And if you enjoy Yakuza games, there is genuinely nothing stopping you from still enjoying Yakuza Like a Dragon, besides these boneheaded preconceived notions that people have that the game should have never existed. Because you know what? I love RPGs. I've played so many to the point that it is my favorite genre of game. But despite that, I can easily admit that Yakuza Like a Dragon was not a very strong RPG. And yet, all of the things that make it a Yakuza game, being the way the story is presented, the side content, the world, the music, all that stuff is still present and was done very well. So I still really enjoyed it and could definitely appreciate what they did and how they did it. And because of what they did, the creators were able to refresh themselves and immediately after Like a Dragon, we got Lost Judgment. But now going back to talking about Infinite Wealth, although they only did one turn-based game, they were still able to once again refresh themselves with the three and a bit releases that they had between 2020 and now. And thanks to that, we now have a gargantuan an improvement to the previous game in the genre. So long story short, it's okay for anyone to take breaks every now and then and do something that you want to do because when you come back to what you were doing, you may notice that you've improved. If you just hammer on the same spot over and over again and never take a step back, you may never realize you put the nail on the wrong spot. And I say that as an analogy for when you make like 15 brawler games in a row, you may not realize that tailing missions are the worst goddamn idea you've ever had in the company's history. You know what though? Rather than just talking about it, I'm gonna go back to playing the game now and I'm gonna try and play it as much as possible before Tekken 8 convinces me to come over with those sexy eyes it's been looking at me with. But Tekken 8 will have to Tekken wait, because infinite wealth is... WHAT?! Well anyway, critics have already said that this is the best Yakuza game. I have already been experiencing the effects of this is probably the best Yakuza game, and I'm sure many of you may end up making that call too. But we'll give it a bit before we jump to any conclusions, and by that I mean I'm not ready to say goodbye to Lost Judgment yet. Although, if this game takes Lost Judgment's place as easily the most fun Yakuza game, what an honorable way to go out. Beaten by the game that was a culmination of all of the lessons learned from previous games created by a newly restructured team on both the western side and the eastern side who have now had their first full and proper release. The confidence that these developers have had in promoting the goddamn hell out of this game was well deserved and it's amazing to see how much the series has grown even within the last year to the point where they can advertise the game in Times Square and to the point where they can still refuse to just give me the game early because they know I'm not going to play it for a review but because I don't want to have to wait as long because it kills me. But also, lol, XQC. If these are the people now responsible for these games, then the Yakuza series... Nah, actually, the Like a Dragon series is in the most capable hands that could ever hold it, and I am beyond excited for what they do next. But for now, if you got to this point in the video, thank you for watching. I look forward to making more videos about this incredible game. So if you look forward to watching them, subscribe, so that way my parents can finally have a reason to not be disappointed in me. And if you want more incentive to subscribe, well, uh, I'll leave you with this then.